Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle HR Leadership Forum Tech Check 2022. My name is Vicki Lynn Brunskill with Argyle. I'm just going to go just give you a couple of reminders. Please do stop by our sponsors virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience today. To ask questions throughout this session, you simply type into the Q&A chat. We'll address those at the end of the session. I am Vicki Lynn Brunskill from Argyle, as I said, and I will be your moderator today. And I am so thrilled to have a fabulous panelist with us today. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. I'm going to start with you, Shaker. Thanks, Vicki Lynn. Hello, everyone. I'm Shaker NV, and I lead uh, work Willis Towers Watson's work analysis and design practice globally, which is part of our work and rewards business. It includes our future of work solutions of design and effectiveness, strategic workforce planning, and labor market analysis. Very happy to be part of this panel today. Eliana, over to you. Thank you, Shaker. Hi, everyone. My name is Eliana Ricci. I am the director of our child compensation and benefits at DICOMA, which is a nationwide law firm. I have uh, about 20 years of benefits experience, mostly in professional services and legal industry. And um, my experience include um, overseeing health and welfare, retirement, wellness uh, in the US as well as globally. And I'm very happy to be here at, and be, being part of this panel. Hi, my name is uh, Vandy Terrio, and I'm coming uh, from uh, from you from uh, Montana. <laughs> um, I've got uh, 20 years uh, of HR experience, um, ranging uh, from supporting um, the retirement of the NASA shuttle program uh, from a workforce planning perspective, um, banking, uh, credit union to media news. I'm very passionate um, about wellness and um, and measurements uh, and also um, overall workforce planning. So really happy to be here and look forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Welcome to all of you. We're so glad that you're here. I know this is going to be a great discussion. So without further ado, let's uh, we're going to begin our our, our panel discussion titled Total Rewards and Wellness Strategies for a Tough Hiring Environment. So our first discussion question today, and I'm going to start, I'm going to put you on the spot, Shaker, and, and call on you first. Um, tell us what you think is the greatest obstacle in the creation and management of total rewards and wellness programs. And then I want to hear from everyone else. Uh, sure, Rickland, that's an excellent question to start off our discussion. Uh, there are three main obstacles that I would like to point out. Number one, and I would say there has been a fundamental shift in what employees and candidates valued before the pandemic and what they value now. We all know that employees are seeking a lot more flexibility in how and where they choose to work. They are looking for more health and wellness related perks and benefits. And they're also asking for their pay and benefits to be more personalized for their individual needs, right? So that I would say is sort of, you know, the number one trend that I'm seeing. Second, we all know that inflation is very high at the moment and the cost of providing these benefits is shooting up. But simultaneously, companies are also under a tremendous pressure to deliver profitable growth in these highly volatile times. How do you balance the two in a very tight labor market is a big challenge that I see. And, and finally, you know, we have a multi-generational workforce at play here who have different needs. And you gotta look also look at it from a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. And the needs also vary by different work arrangements that we have today, right? So if you do a one size fits all strategy, that's too general and ineffective, doesn't work, right? Too much segmentation is also unfortunately complex, ineffective, and expensive. How do you balance the two uh, is an ongoing challenge that I see. So those are the, the three that I would point out with Kellen. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you on personalization. Um, Aliona, did you have anything to add there? Um, I think Shaker actually outlined all of the challenges. Um, I think additional challenge that I've seen pre-pandemic and since pandemic is how do we communicate effectively with our workforce? So even if we do have the funds and the resources, um, and all those 
of valuable, excellent programs to offer, how do we tell our employees um, that they're available, that they're out there so that they can actually use them? Um, so that's the ongoing challenge I've seen pre-pandemic. And I think it's even more so now when we have uh, remote workers out there and how do we balance the communication and tailor the communication to those that are remote and to those that are actually coming on site. Thank you. And Vandy, um, and the communication is another great topic for this. Vandy, um, any input on the question of obstacles, greatest obstacles? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Shaker and Aliona really nailed it. Um, I think, you know, just sort of reflecting on this question, um, I really kind of nail it down to um, alignment and autonomy. Um, I think that um, we're operating in probably, in my career, one of the most complex um, uh, environments um, where, you know, it's not just about, um, you know, hybrid and remote work, but you also have this need um, for, you know, more autonomy in terms of gig, um, you know, the gig economy and where employees really are um, evaluating, you know, how they want to live their life first versus their career first. And so I just think um, really being able to um, look at that to compete while still think, staying focused on, you know, what is your purpose and your values and what are you investing in um, so that you can deliver on your, your business strategy. So, um, so I couldn't agree more. Okay, so we have a, we just got a question on competition, so on competing. So I'll go to that next. First, I wanted to go back to you, Shaker, on the personalization. You know, um, I've heard lots of you know having done a few of these events um, and and talking about personalization. Um, can it be too personal? Um, and what are some of the practices you know that you see, or just one is fine if you, to make it personal? Yeah, yeah, that that's a great question, right? So, um, you know, benefits packages, you know, I mean, in general, right? We all know uh, that everybody is looking for something that's more more personal, right? But 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 there are trade offs to consider, right? Um, if you, uh, you know, the, the 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 question is, I mean, like I said before. Um, you know, if you go too granular, then it becomes too complex and very expensive to handle. If you if you just keep it at a very broad level, right? It doesn't meet the needs of needs of anybody, right? And then you know, I mean, it, this is a very delicate balancing act, and there are also challenges with communication, right? Uh, to to Aliona's point, you know, I have seen sort of you know great benefits packages that are that are designed. But I think how do you how do employees actually experience the benefits that you're you're offering is extremely complicated, right? So you know, I mean, not everybody is educated on all the different benefits uh, that are available and how they can benefit from them. So what I am uh, seeing though is there are a lot of you know AI driven softwares that are at least making things a little easier. So you can go in, even if I don't know what I'm looking for, it starts off by asking some basic questions and then it leads you down a certain path, right? I, I love that actually. And I think that's a great improvement compared to what we used to have three to five years back. But on the other side, you know, if I look at you know the total rewards package more broadly, right? So we have done, you know, as uh, HR professionals, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back and say we have done a great job on the benefit side. But if you think about, you know, comp, uh, are we able to personalize our comp packages, uh, you know, to that extent in terms of, you know, what should be by my base pay as you know short term incentive, long term incentive? Uh, our employees are also starting to ask about personalizing that. I, I think, you know, we don't have any software packages that I have seen that allows you to do that, unfortunately. I think we still have a lot of work ahead of us in our ability to deliver those kinds of personalized experiences from a total uh, rewards perspective, right? It's, so I'm impressed by what we're able to do on the benefit side, not so much on, on the, the other aspects of it, if it makes sense. 
That does. Thank you. I was going to go to the question in the Q&A, but I want to wait for that. I'm going to hold it until the end um, that came in on com competing so we can all give it a, a good go and good answers. Um, the next question that we had, and, and Shaker, what you said go, flows cor perfectly into it. Um, and I'm going to ask you, Aliona, to um, chime in first. Um, which total rewards and wellness technologies and processes are helping meet the needs of today's hybrid workforce and what are some of the related challenges there? Yes, absolutely. Um, so just going back to a shaker's point, um, first, before you even look at your benefit packages or implementing a certain benefit that you think is trendy or everyone else is doing it or competitors are doing it, you need to understand the needs of your population. You need to, you need to understand um, the diversity of your population, um, gen even you know, going down deeper to generational diversity. Like, look at your population and see what the needs are, and that's that. From there, you can start looking at what you actually need to do to enhance your benefit package. And there are so many options out there that are available to you. So many vendors. Um, you know, the biggest thing right now is virtual. Um, and that's here to stay, um, especially for the remote uh, employees. Um, some of the benefits that have been trained in and uh, have been requested by employees is, you know, access to virtual healthcare, well being, um, physical therapy, virtual mental health. Um, so there are tons of vendors that offer virtual visits, um, um, virtual, phys uh, virtual physical therapy, as well as virtual mental health counseling. Um, and by virtual, I mean, it could be done over the phone, it could be done on your computer, via video, um, as well as chatting on your phone or texting with a counselor. Um, so, um, so lots of options there. Um, the other um, uh, uh, packages um, that I think um, are being requested in, and in this remote work environment is um, technology stipends or home office stipends. So those that are no longer working full time in the office or at least on a hybrid schedule, they now have a new office to go to at, at their houses. So how do they make their workspace better, healthier, um, ergonomically healthier at home, that they're not working on the couch or in the at the kitchen table? Um, so supporting those employees with providing some sort of stipends um, to them. Um, and then in terms of processes, you know, looking at automating your processes. So um, versus, you know, being in the office and being able to print a form and sign the form and scan it, you know, finding ways to automate that, that eliminate the paperwork and making it easier to, um, you know, enroll in benefits online, access your benefits online, um, electronically sign the documents. Um, basically as, as much of automation as you could do, you know, uh, attest to a policy um, online. Again, um, eliminate the paperwork as much as you can. Uh, I am the big proponent, no paperwork, <laughs> but I know it's, you know, a long journey. We're getting there, but, you know, not all organizations are able to get there as fast as they probably want to. Um, access to virtual learning opportunities too, because because now we don't have to be physically in, at the location at a university or some sort of business location to learn something, to attend a conference, to attend a webinar. We're doing it right now. It's virtual. So access to that is great. And then you know, other benefits like access to childcare, elder care resources. Again, looking at your population, you know, do you have younger population? Do you have mid middle aged population? Do they have children? Uh, is it the sandwich generation that now has to take care of elderly um, parents? Um, so finding ways to provide 
that type of access virtually again, um, meaning uh, connecting to someone who is um, in another location who can make a call or who you can talk to on the phone to um, to get assistance with um, elder care resources. And then the other things that I, I've seen that have been more uh, at the top of the list is flexibility and time off. Um, because again, since pandemic, we've been on the Zoom calls nonstop. Um, and you know, being mindful of that and knowing how it impacts our employees and how it uh, also impacts our health, mental, physical, um, and leads to burnout, um, finding strategies to eliminate the constant Zoom calls, you know, find something creative, like on Fridays, no Zoom calls, so no meetings, no meetings Friday. So um, encourage people to take to go outside and take a walk and just being more creative. But again, it all goes back to understanding your population because you could, you could, if you have unlimited resources, you could throw all of those benefits at them and think, yes, I checked all my boxes. But <laughs> if, if you don't know your population, you will be wasting a lot of money and resources because those benefits would be underutilized. Great points. Great points. Know the, know the audience. Vandy, you have some thoughts on you know, total rewards and wellness technologies and processes that are helping meet the needs of this hybrid workforce? Yeah, I mean, I would just add, you know, really involving if you have ERG groups, um, involving them um, into evaluating your um, your offerings um, and also uh, the experience as well. So I think including ERGs, including somebody with a background from um, you, that has background in user experience um, so that you're really looking holistically at what you're offering and um, what the experience is. Thank you. And Shaker, did you have anything to add there? Uh, just very uh, briefly, you know, virtual career fairs are important, right? I mean, you know, as I, especially as I think about, you know, new employees, right, uh, you know, who are getting onboarded, who don't have the benefit of being, you know, in proximity with seasoned, you know, colleagues. Uh, I think they are a population that I feel are, are, are feeling the brunt of uh, <laughs> this remote work in a, in a way, right? Uh, obviously, they are enjoying the flexibility and freedom, but when it comes to uh, signing up for their benefits, they generally, hey, they've never worked before, right? So a lot of them coming straight out of the campus, they have no idea what they're signing up for. They need a lot of education and handholding. So whatever we can do to improve their experience, I think would go a long way in, in, in sort of helping them get signed up for the right benefits and, and deriving value out of it, right? So virtual career fairs is something that everybody should consider low cost, easy to implement, uh, goes a long way in helping some of these, you know, um, uh, millennials. Yeah, I think too, the other thing I would um, suggest as well is as you're, you know, really looking at whether it's millennials or, um, you know, how employees define their families, um, really ensuring that um, you're, you're offering um, more than the traditional, you know, benefit package. And even taking a step further, like, um, asking questions to your vendors, you know, making sure you're doing those benchmarking, but things simple as even 401k, you know, when they project out retirement, are they taking into consideration people that are off ramping, um, you know, really make sure, and that's where I think having that ERG involved and, and making sure that you just don't take for granted what, what we've always been given uh, as HR leaders from our vendors, um, ask those diversity, equity, belonging questions. How were these models created? Who are they benefiting? Um, are they benefiting, you know, today's definition of family, today's definition of a good life? Um, I think that's really important. Almost goes back, right? Know your know your population again. Who, what what are they really looking for? Um, Bandy, I'm going to keep, stay with you for this question, and um, and of course, I want to hear from everyone else as well. Um, how have you seen organizations measure effectively measure employee wellness experiences? Um, which metrics matter? Uh, what do you see coming in terms of the future with transform you know transformative technologies, relevant benefits, wellness rewards in the in that this space and um, those meaningful metrics? 
Sure. So I'll share um, quick some lessons learned from my own experience here and some areas that have um, have been very meaningful and impactful with um, the design of measurement. Um, I think early, you know, my career, we sort of measured um, a lot of the quantitative measures, you know, utilization, um, you know, how competitive was your cost structure, your premiums, your design. And, you know, that can get a little overwhelming um, and get, you know, a little data analysis and you find yourself in the boardroom with somebody saying, and what problem are we trying to solve here? Um, so I think stepping back and one of the things um, we did at one organization um, is we really relied on a research group that knew how to measure well-being. So in this case, it was, it was Gallup. There's others out there. But we wanted to make sure that we had a framework for what we were measuring and that it mattered. It really correlated statistically um, to a thriving life and uh, to business performance. And it's really hard to find that type of research. It's very difficult to do it on your own. Um, and so we worked with Gallup. We used their well-being index which I highly recommend just to, to look at. Um, and it uh, really focused on financial health. So for us, that was short term and long term. You know, are we competitive in our pay, um, the structure um, and critical roles we tied it to workforce planning and long term? You know, what are our um, uh, competitive benefits and how do we want to distinct, distinguish ourselves in the market, such as the 401k and catering um, those projections? Um, uh, the other areas, so we had financial health, um, we also looked at, um, you know, physical and mental health, uh, that was the second area uh, of focus, and so, you know, again, just not just the uh, traditional, um, you know, benefit designs, but also looking at, you know, our EAP, what services are we providing, how healthy are our managers, um, you know, they are really important as coaches, um, and, you know, helping support um, the health of our organization. Um, the third area we looked at was community and belonging. We, uh, community and social is what Gallup calls it. We, we called it belonging because that was important to our core purpose was called BU Belongs. We called it belonging. And in that, we looked at really measuring the typical question, do I have a best friend at work? But we also looked at my opinions count. So we did add some qualitative questions, which I think are important. Um, and then we looked at, you know, are people participating um, in ERGs? Are they participating in the community? Are we doing enough to support them to, for instance, serve on boards? Are we working that into our career plan? So those are some of the metrics we use there. Um, and then, um, you know, finally, uh, we um, looked at, I'm sorry, oh, career, <laughs> career thriving. Um, so we looked at, you know, engagement, uh, career development, career pathing, um, and, you know, how are we supporting that? One of the key measures we used there was our internal succession rate and really dicing that up from a diversity um, uh, perspective as well. Are we growing our own talent? Are they better off uh, than they were, you know, a, a year later um, in terms of investment, um, as well as, you know, hey, here's a critical capability that we've identified for in workforce planning. For instance, it's analytical. Um, how many people, you know, are, are taking part of um, getting uh, training in that area, certification in that area, job rotations, you know, project experience. Um, and, you know, that was just more because that can get kind of complex to Shaker's point, um, but just being able to offer our, so our metric was what are we offering to grow that key capability and we kept it just to four key capabilities I think it's really important to focus on, you know, what are the uh, finite capabilities you need to execute on your strategy and how do you measure that. But really just having that framework really helped us with not getting um, so many measurements. It was very well respected with the board. Um, and what we found is that three years later, all those other little measurements, we saw positive lifts in. So it really, really uh, was effective. Um, the other thing that we were able to do later was we did go back to look at utilization and say, well, you know, why are we not having a high utilization and a benefit that is our second highest investment? Um, and so, you know, that got into is the experience choppy, is there friction there, or is this just not a valued, um, you know, a valued benefit and where can we invest, you know, elsewhere in. So I, I again, just go back to, hey, it's really good to have a solid framework that you can stand on that you know is sound from a business perspective and then model out from there.
Very good. Eliana, did you have anything to add there? Bill Shaker's just left for a moment. I think he had a tech issue, so he'll be right back. Um, those are all great um, points that Vandy made. Um, I would add that you know um, if there's um, if there's a way to do a global engagement survey, um, it could be very powerful. You can work with um, like a, a, an organization like Gallup, or you could work with your health and welfare broker. Um, I know um, there are bro uh, brokers out there that have the resources to help with such a survey. Um, and just um, general like touch surveys that you could do, of course, not overdoing them during the year, but strategically planning them to gather the feedback from your population um, and then measure, uh, um, then develop what you want to develop and then measure that um, as your success metric. And um, Going back to the vendor, also working with your vendors. Utilization is, is one metric that we all use, um, but um, there are certain vendors out there that um, really can show you how their program can benefit your population and actually can guarantee, believe it or not, a return on investment through their measurement and tracking. I, Actually, my experience worked with a vendor that did just that and were able to provide us with really good metrics um, that were so apparent uh, on our claim experience um, that, um, that we could present to our leadership to show that there is a benefit to this program. And just, I, I won't name the vendor, but it was related to virtual physical therapy benefit that was tied directly to our medical plan so um, so we were able to reduce the cost through offering the uh, through claim cost related to musculoskeletal issues through offering this program. So like looking at your vendors and seeing what their options are is another way to to measure. Thank you so much. Shaker, did you have any input on you know what which mat metrics matter when you're measuring uh, effectively employee well wellness experiences? So I'll try to be brief, you know, I mean, I agree with everything that was already shared, right? So the other uh, aspect to consider is, you know, you really need to benchmark, obviously, the benefits that you're offering, right? So look at the industry benchmark, and then obviously decide, you know, where you want to position yourself from a competitive perspective. Do you want to be in the 75th percentile or 50th percentile or whatever suits, you know, your company, you got to take a, take a position and say, this is where I want to be from a competitive from the competitive positioning, right? So that is something, you know, for you all to, to consider on a regular basis. And second, I would say, you know, yeah, you know, utilization metrics are great, but, you know, focus more on the effectiveness metrics. You know, we all gravitate towards uh, utilization and efficiency metrics. You know, I would say, you know, focus more on the effectiveness metrics as, you know, some of my fellow panelists already pointed out. I think that would probably give you a better ROI on your investment. Thank you. Now we have been getting some terrific questions. So I have one more general discussion question, and then um, I think we're going to dive into those questions. Um, I'm going to start with you, Shaker, on this one. Um, how can HR leaders gain insight into whether their total rewards package is competitive? And we have a couple of questions, some other competitive questions, and attractive to prospective employees. And what is attracting today's employees? That's a big question. Uh, it is, you know, happy, happy to to start. And then obviously, you know, my fellow panelists can can add to, to what I say. Well, I mean, there is a lot of data out there, uh, right, in terms of what employees value, especially in terms of, you know, total rewards and its impact on a firm's ability to attract and retain talent. Right. So most of the you know, large consulting firms and your vendors do these surveys on an annual basis. They've been doing these for decades. So, you know, make sure, you know, you're looking at that information uh, on a regular basis because things do shift. Right. Especially based on, you know, our earlier discussion. Right. So before the pandemic and after the pandemic, there has been a seismic shift. So it's important for you to be on top of that information. So based on, you know, some of the studies that I have seen recently, these were global studies. So it's important for you to also sort of, you know, look at uh, differences by country, differences by, you know, your demographic population, uh, et cetera. So what we're seeing in the market is, look, I mean, despite, you know, all the labor market tightness that we're seeing, worker attachment to their employer remains 
uh, you know, as high as it has been since 2013, right? Uh, believe it or not, especially, you know, I mean, I think, I don't know whether you all saw, you know, Wall Street Journal, art, uh, you know, news item that came out this morning, especially this uh, relates more to uh, people who work in the offices, actually, right? So that's the, the, the population that's still, you know, very much attached to their employer, which is a good thing. Uh, nevertheless, many employees are also looking around for new opportunities uh, given the tight labor market. Exit risk is particularly high among senior staff and early career employees. Uh, in, in terms of what's top of mind for, for employee security is top of mind for employees. You know, pay, benefits, and job security are the key factors that we are seeing across you know, all the different segmentation that you can possibly look at for attracting and retaining talent, followed by flexible work arrangements. So this is what we are seeing in the data. Uh, and obviously, you know, I mean, for this population it should not be news to any of you, you know, benefits packages that meets the needs of the employees and provide an enhanced experience, experience result in significantly less job search and greater retention, right? Retirement is the area of benefits that employees most want their employer to improve and focus on. And another thing I would strongly recommend is, you know, if you have not considered doing a total rewards optimization survey, I think it's really important you should consider looking at one, you know, for folks who are not familiar with that methodology, it is a surveying method. It has been used for many years in, in marketing to capture subjective preferences. You know, you ask employees to make trade-offs among the different program features as opposed to assessing each of those features individually. So think about, you know, if when you're buying a car, right? So, you know, car salesmen could say, you know, hey, are you looking for a car that has a high horsepower? Are you looking for fuel efficiency or, or is cost a consideration, right? You know, the reason the salesman is asking you all these questions, very difficult to say, you know, I can give you a car that's gonna do all of this, right? So that's the idea here. You have to make some trade-offs and decide, you know, what do you value more than, than something else, right? So gone are the days when you ask your employees, okay, you know, are you satisfied with all the, the benefits that you're offering, right? So they, they were, they were going to rate things for you. And obviously, you know, I've been doing this for many years. When it comes to pay and benefits, you know, you get the bottom most grade, right? You don't want to be number five on everything. Uh, that means, you know, you're paying your people too much and none of us want that either, uh, right? But I think the real question to ask is, you know, what's the trade-off? So this particular technique gives you a more reliable forecast of behavior than traditional survey methods, gives you ideas for maximizing the value from your investments, you get the maximum bang for your buck, and gives you segment-specific strategies. So, you know, I highly recommend that you consider, you know, more modern, sophisticated techniques to figure out what your employees really care about so that you can maximize your investments. Thank you, thank you. Um, anyone have anything to add on that? I'm gonna we're gonna go like two minutes we have before we're heading over to those questions from the audience. I think Baker said it all. Um, he did touch on in the retirement, um, and I want to just expand just a little bit on that. That it's important to consider the entire wellness package, financial wellness. By that I mean financial wellness. Um, not just retirement, but again, going back to lo looking at your population and how can you support your population with a financial package, something that we haven't been thinking about um, before and mostly focused on mental health and wellness, but um, financial is a, is a huge component of the total well-being and ties in very closely to all the other aspects of well-being of your population. Thank you for that. So, our, you know, a question that came in early in on our com in, in the conversation was about comp competing, and and the question is, how can smaller companies better compete with those larger, more well-financed companies that offer a lot more compelling rewards pa packages? Has does anyone have any comments on that one? 
I can comment. Um, you know, it's not really uh, you, costism is 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 is. is is important, of course, um, when you look for the benefits package. But again, putting on your creative hat and looking at other resources that you may already have through your existing relationships with the vendors that you're already paying, maybe paying for it, or are already available to you at no cost because you have that relationship. It's an additional program, uh, maybe uh, a set of communications, um, again, but go into the financial wellness package, look at your retirement record keeper and have a conversation with them about all the resources that they probably already include in their record keeping fee um, to your organization, um, looking at the webinars, the educational sessions, all the um, additional life events resources that, that, that they may offer and um, creating a communication strategy to communicate that this is already available to you. This is how you're supporting your employees. And then the other um, ways you can enhance your package is to, again, look at your, what do they want? So if they want more flexibility, can your organization provide more of that? Can you um, allow your population to be, uh, more remote and less in the office. What other in, uh, smaller investments can you make to uh, make um, make it more attractive, but at a less cost? Yeah, you know, I would just like to add, look, I mean, when it comes to benefits and uh, retirement, uh, you know, cost of administration, right? Scale, scale is is your friend, right? So if you have if you have a larger size, you have a natural advantage over over everybody else, right? So you know, I mean that that's how it works, unfortunately. But if you are a smaller sized company, and I think that you know you have some advantages too, right? So to to Aliona's point, you know, it's easier for you to understand your population because you have. <laughs> you know, a smaller population to deal with. And then, you know, you can also communicate with them better, right? So this is where, you know, big companies will fail. And I think you have a, an advantage over them, if it makes sense. I would also just add, um, you know, look sort of outside of the traditional offerings, even looking at, you know, what, what grants are out there available. Um, when I was working with a contractor at NASA, um, you know, we were able to offer really great um, certifications and development type training through a grant. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of things that, you know, small companies um, have an advantage of in, in terms of looking beyond the traditional benefits. Thank you. Oh my goodness, there's so many good questions. <laughs> um, so what this one's on communication and we, we touched on communication and how important it is. Um, and they asked, what are some creative and successful approaches you would suggest for others to consider when communicating um, rewards, total rewards, benefits? Anybody have any uh, ideas? Yeah, beyond the traditional email communication, Zoom meetings, um, you know, it, it, de it depends on the organization and the culture. Um, I do feel like um, having uh, ERGs is, is a great way, uh, and that's employee resource groups, have, um, have a great way to kind of be that um, group to spearhead and communicate on your behalf. Um, and then working with vendors, um, now that we are either fully remote or hybrid um, mailings, I know it is more like very traditional way of communicating, but postcards um, work really well because now you have an, an additional touch point um, beyond your employee because once the postcard arrives at the home, you have a spouse, you have other family members who get that piece of communication and um, if he has to pay more attention to it. And then uh, for those that, that in the office, you know, flyers were great. Um, now going to more, more modern ways of communicating technology, you know, working with, the, with your IT 
on um, other options that they may be able to suggest. Um, for example, my, my IT department recently um, gave, uh, told me that they can do a pop-up message on the laptop to remind people about the open enrollment, a similar notification when they have to reboot your computer or text messaging or um, you know, mass voice messaging. Um, desk drops is a traditional method, of course. Um, I, I think the flyers on, in the common areas, <laughs> I know it's still traditional, but I, I feel like it works really well for those that are in the office because everyone has an office now, um, I mean, a phone. Um, and so if you have a flyer with a QR code and you put it on your uh, refrigerator or somewhere where people commonly gather, um, is that they will have their phone so they can scan a QR code and it will take them to whatever message or site you want them to go. I just recently did that for the beneficiary update campaign. Um, so we included the QR code and we had a great, great participation during that campaign. I would, um, th those are great points. It made me think of a thing I, I feel like is really important as um, HR leaders is, is it's hard to look at some of our communications from as a product and it is our brand. Um, so really making sure that it comes across that way, um, using infographics, using um, ways where uh, employee quotes or um, you know, having leaders involved in communicating, but just making sure that everything that you send out, that's really important, you can't do this everything, but that it really does represent um, your brand and it looks like a product that you know, marketing uh, would do. Um, the other thing I would just um, advocate is making sure um, your managers um, are talking uh, about well-being and benefits. Um, you know, we had a focus where we had our um, employees, uh, our male employees really talk about the importance of taking parental leave um, to, uh, to new dads. Um, I think those, those things really do help. And the final thing I'd say is, um, just using some of the cool, you know, nuggets around uh, doing a calendar. We do that a lot with diversity, um, and you can incorporate like this month's, you know, um, ADD month, neurodivergent. Um, just making sure to use those things that are out there where you can really highlight this is what we offer to support um, this uh, this month's uh, focus area of awareness. Uh, I think is could be fun and a nice way to tie into your diversity plan as well. Uh, maybe I'll just add, um, you know, my my two cents on it, you know, more on the digitized side, right? So I don't want to comment on the traditional, you know, I mean, I think, Eliana, you, you covered a lot of ground there. O on the digitized experiences, you know, uh, you know, companies are starting to use more sort of, you know, this communication portals. Uh, what it allows you to do is it allows you to have a more personalized experience based on who, who you are, you will see only information that's relevant to you, right? So that's one advantage. And second, you know, you have a better way to track, you know, who is looking at that information so that you can refine your communication based on the metrics that you can see, right? So it's a constantly evolving, you know, mechanism with constant feedback, that's one. So you can use a lot of AI and machine learning algorithms to back that. Uh, and then you can also sort of, you know, bring in chatbots and stuff uh, to, 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 to make it all, you know, more cost effective, right? So those are, you know, some creative things that I have, I have seen. Thank you. Thank you to our audience for sending all these fabulous questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. My goodness. And thank you so much, Shaker, Vandy, and Aliana for a, what an insightful panel discussion. We could have gone on for hours. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for this fantastic session. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thank you again to all three of you. Uh, what a fabulous discussion.